you so much for that special music this morning. Let's go to the book of Exodus, if you would. Exodus chapter 32 in, in the Word of God is where we'll be for a couple of minutes. And again, just want to express my appreciation to Pastor for allowing us to come and allowing us to uh, be part of the services today. And uh, got to be over at the, uh, the other campus this morning and then getting to be here and uh, seeing all that God is doing. I praise the Lord for it. I praise the Lord that He is still at work and He is still working mightily all around us. And as an evangelist, we have the privilege to, to be able to travel around and to be able to see God's hand at work in a lot of different places. And I can't, I can't tell you what a privilege and what a blessing that is to be able to take my family and to be able to just serve God and be able to travel and be able to see all that God is doing. And, and can I tell you, get involved. Jump right in and get involved with all that God is doing and all that God is doing here. And um, tonight, with the, with the opportunity for outreach, I would encourage you to jump in and get involved. Say, man, I'm a little nervous. I don't know. But I've never done anything like that before. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure pastor's not going to just throw you to the wolves, all right? He's not going to just throw you out there and he'll put you with somebody who's at least been out before. And, and uh, it'll be a good time. And you know what? It's good to get out of our comfort zone. It's good to get out of what's easy and what comes naturally to us uh, because outside of our comfort zone is where God works. I don't know if you found that. I don't know if you if you figured that out, but <laughs> can I tell you, that's often the time and often the place where we see the fingerprints of God is outside of our comfort zone, outside of what comes naturally to us. And I'm sure thankful for that. I'm sure thankful for the song this morning and, and for what God's going to do here in the message. Can we pause? Let's ask God to help us, and then we'll dive into the Word this morning. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for allowing us to be in church on Time Change Sunday. Lord, for the freedom that we have to worship. Lord, for the ability to come here to, to this beautiful facility and open up God's Word. And I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us. I pray that you'd take distractions and the cares of this world, Lord, help us lay those to the side, and I pray, Lord, that you would minister to us and speak to us, and that, Lord, we would be willing to respond to your word, not to a preacher. Lord, I'm nothing, but you're everything, and your word, every time it's open, has the, Lord, has the potential and the power to change our lives. So I pray that you'd bless the word, Lord, would you bless the preaching of it, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Exodus 32 is where your Bibles are open. I want us to begin reading in verse number one. We'll read a few verses as we introduce the message this morning. The Bible says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered bird offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and a drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. This morning for a few minutes I want us to, to focus on this topic insidious idols insidious idols you see idolatry is something that we see here in this passage and it's something that, 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 that has been known throughout bible times and throughout history where people have really as as their mode of worship have bowed themselves down to gods that they have created with their own hands gods of gold gods of wood that they fashioned themselves and have bowed themselves down to and worshipped. And we still see it in our society today. We still see it, especially as you look around the world at some of the different religions where people are worshipping these false gods. They're worshipping these idols. In fact, when I was an assistant pastor up in Pennsylvania, I, I, I came face to face with this reality as uh, one of my responsibilities was the outreach ministry. And we would go out on a regular basis, as you all are doing this evening, and, and try to impact our community, try to reach out to our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's the gospel that's going to make the difference. Not some politician, 
not some new policy, now, not some new social program, no matter how good it might be. It's the gospel that's going to make the difference in our cities. And so we would reach out. We would go and, and, and go door to door often and, and, and try to get the gospel to people. And I remember one particular day we were going into a neighborhood. And, and in this neighborhood there were a, a large number of people that were, that were of the Hindu religion. People that had come from, from India and that part of the world and had uh, come over to Pennsylvania where I was the assistant pastor and, and, and they had, uh, many of them had, had moved into these communities and we were trying to reach them with the gospel. And in reaching a Hindu person with the gospel, it's important that you realize that they serve and they worship a, a great number of gods. And if you're not careful, and what we found is when you would present the gospel to them, uh, they kind of, their religion works on a good karma and a bad karma basis. And so the more good karma you do, the, the better off that you'll be in the next life. And so they would be often very polite and very kind to you and listen to what you have to say. And, and some of them would even pray a prayer to, and to get you off their porch perhaps, but they, they, would, they would just be very kind to you. And they would take Jesus and they would just kind of throw him on top of this big pile of gods that they have. But can I tell you, Jesus isn't going to just be thrown on a, a pile with a bunch of other gods. No, no. The Bible says in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus speaking to his disciples says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if in order for you to have Bible salvation, in order for you to, to, to be saved from your sin problem and have a home in heaven, it's got to be only Jesus. Not Jesus plus your other gods. Not Jesus plus your baptism. Not Jesus plus your church membership. Not Jesus plus your good works. But Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen. And so we would try to make that very clear in, in, in sharing the gospel. But I remember one particular day we were going to visit a family where we had been there before. We had been there a couple times and a relationship had kind of been formed there. And so we were going to visit him yet again. I believe the wife had trusted Christ for salvation, but the husband had not. And he was still very much steeped in Hinduism and, and the tradition of it all. And so we went and knocked on the door, and, and they were happy to see us and invited us in, and we began to talk and, and talk about, you know, make small talk, and eventually things kind of turned over to spiritual subjects, and uh, they informed us that they were in the midst of one of their Hindu festivals. So, oh yeah, we, we have this festival every year, and, and uh, we have our God set up in the basement, and our fr friends and family come over, and we, we, we worship this God together. And then they asked, would you like to see our God? We said, yeah. <laughs> it's not, not every day you get to see a God in a basement, right? So we said, sure. You know, always, always trying to learn something. And so we go down to the basement there, and it's a, it's a nice finished basement. And, you know, nice drywall and carpet and everything. And we go down the steps and into this room. And the room is, is bare. There's no furniture. There's nothing in the room. It's just a big open room. And then at the end of the room, you see this shrine set up to this God. The God, it was, it was, to be honest with you, it was, it was almost a little scary looking. It had an elephant head and it had all these arms coming out of it. And they had this shrine set up to this God and it was set up on this little pedestal with some steps going up to it and, and a little arbor over the God with, the, with beautiful flowers and everything woven in throughout it. And then the most interesting thing to me was all around the God on the floor, on the carpet there, were paper plates. And on these paper plates were nuts and berries and different fruits. And they had them all set up around this God. They said, yeah, this is, this is our God. And, and you know, our, our, we, we all come over and we, we worship the God together. And then we, we eat the food. And, and they were just explaining to us some of, of all that went on there. And I remember leaving that day saddened. Saddened to to see such spiritual blindness. To see a family so devout, so sincere, going through all these motions to try to appease and try to please their God. A God that can't hear. A God that can't see. A God that can't answer prayer. A God that can do nothing for them. And it sure made me thankful. 
Sure, it made me thankful that I serve the one true God. Sure, made me thankful that his ear is open unto my cry. Sure, made me thankful that I can come to him any time through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for me. You see, religions of this world, they, they're based on what you can do to get favor with God what you have to do to reach the next level, what you have to do to, to get a better reincarnation, whatever it might be. But, but Bible Christianity is based not on what we can do, but what, on what Jesus did for us. Amen. And I'm so glad that I know Jesus. Amen. And can I say, friend, if you're here today and you don't know him, if you're here today and you've never experienced salvation, You've never experienced forgiveness of sins. You've never experienced a peace that passes understanding. You've never, you've never come to Jesus. Oh, can I tell you, there's no better decision you could make today than to in simple humility and in simple faith say, I realize that I'm a sinner on my way to hell because of my sin. And I need a Savior. But we see here in our passage this morning a, a group of people, the Israelites, God's chosen people. And like us as Christians today who have so much to be thankful for, all that God has done for us starting at salvation, even before that, his mercy towards us. And, and since then, all that he has done for us, Israel had seen God do amazing and mighty things. They sure had. No, not too long ago, they had been in slavery in a place called Egypt. And for years and for years, they served the Egyptians. But finally, God heard the cry of his people. And he delivered them through ten plagues. Many of you are familiar with the story. Ten plagues he rained down on the Egyptians until Pharaoh said, get out of here. <laughs> and out goes Israel with a high hand, the Bible says. And they travel a little ways and they come to the Red Sea. And so they have the Red Sea in front of them. A mountain range on one side of them and they turn around and what is coming in the rear view mirror? Here comes Pharaoh and his army. Pharaoh wakes up and realizes, man, we let all the slaves go. Who's going to build all my stuff? <laughs> we got to go get them back. And so here they are in this impossible situation where it seemed that all hope was lost. But God comes through yet again and parts that Red Sea right down the middle. And the Bible tells us that the Israelites walked across on dry land. The Egyptians thought that they'd be so lucky and might be able to make it across too, but as soon as they got in the middle, God pulled those invisible barriers that were holding that water up. And that water came down and destroyed the enemies of, of the Israelites, of God's people. Can I tell you, miracle after miracle, the type of stuff you look at and you say, how could you ever forget that? How could you ever Go serve anybody else with your life, Israel, after all that you've seen. But can I tell you, idolatry is insidious. I like that word. <laughs> it, 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 it sums it up real well. Insidious has the idea of, of sneaky. It comes up slowly and causes great harm. That's the idea of that word. And you might say, well, Brother Drew, <laughs> I, I don't have an idol in my basement. If you do, by the way, okay, that's, that's, that's not good. <laughs> we need to get that taken care of. But you say, oh, Brother Drew, I don't, I don't have, a, I don't have a, an image in my basement that I bow myself down to and worship. But can I tell you, idolatry is still very much alive and well today. Oh, and I'm not just picking on the Hindus or the Catholics or somebody else who, who there's, you walk into a building and you can see idols all over the place and it's very apparent. I'm talking about in independent Baptist churches. Idolatry is alive and well. And really, as you think of idolatry, you think of an idol. An idol is anything that gets into our life and demands and takes away more of our time, reverence, or energy than God Almighty. You see, because the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus Christ is supposed to be on the throne of our lives, Christian. He's supposed to have first place. He's supposed to be calling the shots. But what an idol comes and does is it sneaks in there and it starts to steal away our heart, steal away our time, steal away our energy, steal away God's rightful position as number one in our lives. And can I tell you, our God will not play second fiddle to anybody or anything. 
And so I want us to consider idols this morning and idolatry, and I want us to ask, God, have I allowed an idol to sneak into my life? I want you to notice, first of all, this morning as we consider these insidious idols, I want you to see the conditions of idolatry. The conditions of idolatry. How in the world did Israel, who had just seen God deliver through ten plagues, who had just seen God take them through the Red Sea, rain manna down from heaven to feed them, how did they get to this place? There's a lot of things we could say here. Verse number one, the Bible says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. There's a lot of reasons we could, we could perhaps come to as we look at this passage and we think about it. Maybe they were tired. You ever been tired before? I heard a preacher say this one time. Don't ever make a life-altering decision when you're tired or hungry. I don't know if I have a Bible verse for that exactly, Pastor, but that's good preaching right there. <laughs> Woo! I mean, think about Elijah. One minute he's up calling down fire from heaven, and the next minute he's running for his life a <laughs> hundred miles into the desert, sitting down under a tree and saying, God, kill me. I'm done. What? Maybe they were worn out from the journey. Maybe it clouded their judgment. There's a lot of things we could say. There's a lot of reasons why we get tempted to turn away from God, why, why the devil gets a little foothold. But I think a big one right here that we see in verse number one, that people saw Moses delayed. You know what I call that right there? Unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. <laughs> Moses went up into the mountain. He's, he's up there talking to God. And we were expecting him to be back before now. We, we thought that he was going to be here. We, we don't know what's happened to him. We don't know what is going on right now. And it's amazing to me that the next thing out of their mouth is, Hey, Aaron. Make us a God. <laughs> but again, we could, be, we could be hard on the Israelites. But I don't know about you, but I start looking inward and I realize, man, I'm made of the same stuff they were. Can, can I ask you this? <laughs> Has God ever let you down before? Now, I know he never fails. I know he's always good. But has he ever let you down before? Has there ever been a time where you're like, man, God, God what, what are you doing? God, I, was, I, I thought you were going to answer my prayer this way. I thought you were going to answer my prayer on this timetable right here, Lord. <laughs> but, 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 but I don't see anything happening. God, what is going on? And beware, because at that moment, the devil's going to try to come whisper in your ear. Your own flesh is going to come rearing its ugly head and saying, huh, see, I told you you couldn't trust him. Yeah, I told you he wasn't reliable. What you need is something else to chase after. What you need is something else to satisfy your soul. What you need is something else to help you make it through the day. And in that moment, it can be very easy for us to remove God from the throne and insert idol of our choice into that place. Because of unmet expectations. May God help us to keep our eyes stayed upon him. David said it this way in Psalm 62 and verse 5, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. <laughs> you can't have unmet expectations if you get your expectations from, from him. But we've seen this morning not only the conditions of idolatry, but I want you to notice the cost, the cost of idolatry. And don't you ever let the devil convince you that there isn't a cost. Oh, it's all right. You, you can go to church on Sunday and, and, and serve your flesh the rest of the week. It's all right. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's just kind of the way of the world now. God, God's not quite enough. You need a little something to supplement God when it comes to satisfying your soul. Oh, no, no, no. Listen to me. There's a cost that will be paid when we remove Jesus from his rightful place as, as first place in our lives and we allow something else to slither its way onto that throne. Look at verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them unto me. And the people break off 
the golden earrings. I, I, did you see anything in there that said they had to stop and think about it? Well, do we really want to, I mean, this is gold we're talking about. Do we really want to give all our gold to make this idol? God just delivered us out of Egypt, and the Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. The Egyptians were just giving them stuff. Here, take our stuff and go. Just, just, just get out of here. We can't take this anymore. But they were willing to give the blessings of God. Give them up to have their idol made. Grandma's heirloom they've been holding on to. Here you go, Aaron. <laughs> and it's amazing what you'll be willing to pay. For those of you who may be football fans, back in 2022, Tom Brady made an announcement. How many of you know who Tom Brady is? Okay, a couple of you, a couple of you. It's, it's okay. If you don't, if you, don't it, you, you really aren't missing a whole lot in life, all right? But Tom Brady is a quarterback. He played many years for the New England Patriots and, and uh, won many Super Bowls and is considered by, by many to be the greatest quarterback to ever play football. And he made this announcement after 20-something years of playing quarterback, which is a, a long time. You don't usually see quarterbacks in their 40s still playing in the NFL. But he made the announcement, I am going to retire. I'm done. I'm hanging up the cleats. And uh, I'm, 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 we're going to call it a career. And all of a sudden, the very last touchdown throw that he threw became very significant. And on that ill-fated play, which nobody knew at the time that it was going to be the last touchdown that Tom Brady threw, but he throws the ball and his receiver makes the catch and runs to the end zone. Ah, touchdown celebrates. He takes that ball and he throws it up into the stands. And a very fortunate fan catches that football. The announcement comes out, Tom Brady's retiring, and this fan realizes, man, I am sitting on a jackpot right here. And so he did the only, the only sensible, logical thing. He put it up for auction. <laughs> Let's see how much we can get for this, for this football. And the bidding was fierce, can I tell you. And by the time the dust settled and the final bid was cast, the auction was concluded for the price of $518,000 for a football, which maybe cost 30 bucks at the store for a nice one, which probably cost him about 250 to make in the, in the factory. And here's this super fan, I guess, willing to pay half a million dollars for a football to play with, oh no, to put on a little shelf in his office or whatever, and look at it. <laughs> but if any of you know, are familiar with the story, you'll know that 40 days after Tom Brady makes his big announcement, I retire, that's all it took. It's 40 days at home, and he realized, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> this stay-at-home dad thing is not for me. He makes the announcement, I'm unretiring. I'm going to play another year. And we're going we're to put the cleats back on. It's going to be great. All of a sudden, that football isn't worth a whole lot because it's just not going to be the last one that he throws anymore, last touchdown that he throws. And, you know, the lawyers got all involved and they did their thing. And, oh, the ball is not as originally advertised. And, uh, and they, got the, they got the auction reversed. But the point is, there was a man, an individual. I'm assuming it was a man. I'm not sure. It was an individual who was willing to pay half a million dollars for a football to look at. It's astounding to me. But what's even more astounding and saddening is as I look at my own life and I look at how much I'm willing to give up to chase after some dumb idol. Oh, the protection of God, man, oh, we need it. We're, we're out here on the road, the protection of God is, we're very keenly aware of it. But, ah, you know, who needs the protection of God? I think I can, I, I can live without that to serve my idol. Oh, the blessings of God. Oh, man, they're great. How, how many of you are thankful for the blessings of God today? But how often we'll just whoosh, throw them to the wind to serve some idol. 
I've known and have heard of <laughs> fathers. And I'll pick on us men. My family, yeah. We'll throw that to the wind. I'd rather have I'd rather have this affair. I'd rather serve my own lusts. Israel was willing to pay. They didn't ask Aaron how much. They just said, sure, buddy, here you go. And you'll be amazed at what you're willing to throw away to chase something other than Jesus. Idolatry has a cost. But I want you to notice, thirdly, the corruption of idolatry as we continue on, the corruption. Oh, it'll cost you something, but can I tell you, it's never innocent. It always corrupts. The Bible reminds us, no man can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't have it both ways, folks. We can't say, oh, I'm going to serve God today, and I'm going to serve my flesh tomorrow. It doesn't work like that. We must make a decision. But realize a decision to serve our flesh is a decision that will corrupt everything that is good and holy and righteous around us faster than you can imagine. Because listen to me this morning, you can pick your sin, but you can't pick those consequences. You, 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 can, you can only imagine how far it'll go. And, and, it, and, and like the ripples in a stream, they always go further than you can imagine. But I want you to notice what happens here. They break off these earrings, they give it to Aaron, he makes a molten calf. Verse number five, Aaron saw it. He built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to who? Did y'all see that verse five? End of verse five. Tomorrow is a feast to who? To the Lord. That's a capital L-O-R-D. All capitals. You know who that is? That's Jehovah God. I want you to see just how insidious these idols are. Because here they are having ditched God and having made this molten calf and yet they're doing it in the name of the Lord. They're saying, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're worshiping God over here. Look at it. Verse number six. They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. Ooh, that looks real good, doesn't it? Real religious. Before we go on, can I just, can I just get a quick soapbox real quick? Just because it's got the name Christian on it doesn't mean that it is so. Do not be deceived. There are certain things that do not go together. Christian rock. They don't go together. They don't go together. Oh, no. <laughs> do, do not be deceived. Just because they say the name Jesus doesn't mean that that's who they're following. And we find here, that looks real good. They're bringing our offerings. Oh, it's a, it's a feast to Jehovah. But something wicked and diabolical is going on in this passage. And you say, how do you know, Brother Drew? Because this is what it always turns into. Are you listening to me? When flesh is in charge and Jesus is no longer on the, on the throne, corruption always turns out. The people sat down to eat and to drink. This is not a potluck. Okay, I'm all, I'm all for potlucks. You all have potlucks around here? Is that what you call them? A dinner on the grounds? I, I don't know. Listen, man, it's in there somewhere. One of the Baptist distinctives is food. It's in there. It's in the Greek or something. This became a, a gluttonous, fleshly party is, this, is what this became. To eat and to drink, and then what? And they rose up to play. This is not church volleyball. This is wicked immorality. And as a, as a father of young children, I, 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 I wonder what these kids must have thought as they watched their parents. What? Hey, we're going to church, and we're going to church to sin. That's a whole other, that's a whole other message. I, I can't get into all that. I can't get into all that. I don't have time, Pastor, to get into all that. But they're watching us. If you say one thing and, and, and present one thing in front of everybody else and then live for the devil, are we wondering why they're running away from church? Wonder why we're missing a whole generation of people in churches across this country? Corruption. Their morals changed. Their music changed. <laughs> I know we just touched on music a little bit. Look at verse 17. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. 
Joshua heard the, the music that's going on at this party, and he thinks that they're being attacked. Again, I'm not going to dive all into music standards. I'll leave that to pastor. But can I tell you, there's a difference between God's music and the world's music. Man, God's music is, is pure and lovely, and it points your eyes to him, and it gets you meditating on him and his attributes and his goodness. But the world's music gets you, gets you in your flesh. And Joshua couldn't tell the difference between this, this concert <coughs> sorry, and, and, uh, and the noise of war. Corruption of idolatry. But I want you to see, number four, the consequences as we hasten on. The consequences of idolatry. Like we said earlier, you can pick your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. And there will be a bill to pay when we turn away from God Almighty. You know, I think if it was more immediate... Perhaps we would, uh, <laughs> we would pay attention more. You know, we, we step out of line, all of a sudden, psh, you know, lightning comes down to be like, oh, okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> but aren't you glad we serve a gracious and merciful God? I sure am. I, I, <laughs> Aren't you glad for second chances and third chances and fourth chances and a hundred and millionth chances? I mean, I'm up to a whole bunch. I don't know about you. But may we not take advantage of the grace of God and think, oh, well, the bill hadn't come due yet. So maybe I pulled one over on him. Oh, no. Bill always comes due. One of the consequences of idolatry, I believe, is found in verse 26 and 27. I encourage you when you get home to read this whole passage but I, I, I don't have time to read the whole thing. But Verse 26, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Can I tell you, one of the consequences of idolatry is division. It's division. Moses says, who's on the Lord's side? The children of Levi come to him, and by understanding, everybody else did not. <laughs> and you know what keeps a church going on for God? It's a sweet spirit of unity. And what allows unity to be possible? Because we're not talking about uniformity, okay? Uniformity is everybody is the exact same cookie cutter. I don't believe in all that. I believe God made us different, and we have different backgrounds, we have different upbringings, we have different likes and dislikes, and can I tell you, what? no matter what your background, your circumstance is, God has a place for you right here, and he has a ministry for you right here, and he has something for you to do plugged into his local church. Amen. Say, Brother Drew, I can't preach. Well, <laughs> if everybody was preaching, there'd be nobody listening. We need some toilet scrubbers, hallelujah. <laughs> we need some children's church workers, hallelujah. We need some greeters. We need some snow shovelers. I mean, there's something for you to do here in the work of God. And no one is better than the other. No one is more important than the other. We need all of them work together. Amen. That's the way it ought to be. But what allows a group of people with different backgrounds, likes, dislikes, interests, opinions, what allows us to be unified when we're all chasing the same one? Amen. We're all following the same one. But when he gets off the throne and self gets on the throne or some idol gets on the throne, all of a sudden bickering starts happening. Complaining, fighting starts taking place. And that's, that's not God's plan for his church. Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. In Ephesians 4, and verse 3, I love this first word that Paul uses, endeavoring. <laughs> it's not going to be easy or come natural. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Idolatry tears apart relationships. And fractured relationships happen when God is removed from the throne and self takes his place. And I wonder, I wonder how many churches could be restored to unbroken fellowship. How many families could be restored if we'd all just start putting Jesus first instead of ourselves. Division. And I don't want to linger too long on these, but we see disease in verse 35. The Lord plagued the people because of the calf which Aaron made. The Bible says in verse 35, disease. Not every disease is God's judgment, but sometimes God's got to lay you out. Put you flat on your back so the only direction you can look is up. 
And may we heed God before he has to send a big storm like he did for Jonah. May we heed God before he has to send a big fish. <laughs> may we heed him. And we finally see the final consequence is that of death. We already read it. Verse number 28, the Bible says, The children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. This is no laughing matter, ladies and gentlemen. This is no game that we're playing. We can't control the, the consequences. We can't control who will be affected by just a day of living for yourself. And we cannot afford to take the risk. We can't do it. But I want to leave you on a good note. The conquering of idolatry, fifth and finally. Because <laughs> I believe that it can be conquered. The Bible tells us it can be conquered. If we are to conquer idolatry, I want to give you three quick steps and then we'll be done. Number one, you must realize that you have created an idol. <laughs> you see it there on the screen. If you're not willing to be honest, you're not willing to examine oneself, yourself, and that's something we ought to be doing on a regular basis. Not just once a week on Sunday, if that, but on a regular basis. God, has there, is there something that's crept into my life that is draining my spiritual energy? Is there something that has crept into my life, God, that is trying to take your place or that has taken your place and that's more important to me than you are? <laughs> Here's some questions that you might be able to ask and figure this thing out. What's the first thing you do in the morning? Now, for me, I'm blind as a bat. I've got to put my contact lenses in or else I won't even be able to see the Word of God. But I understand you got some of that you got to do. But where are we turning to in the morning? Oh, I'm not a morning person, Brother Drew. I'm not either. That's why I became an evangelist because we, 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 we services in every night, you know. Amen, amen. Second shift, hallelujah. Can I be transparent with you? You know where I found myself sometimes in the morning? What do you turn to when you're feeling stressed? It's a good question of what's on the throne of your life. It's a good question of where, where, where you're getting your peace, where you're getting your satisfaction from. When you're feeling stressed, ah, where, where do you turn? The world says, oh, you got to turn to this pill. Oh, you got to turn to this, this, this adult beverage. You just forget it all. But where we turn when we're feeling stressed, we're feeling overwhelmed, that, that, that says a lot. How do you spend your downtime? Oh, now you're meddling, Brother Drew. I mean, come on, man. I barely have any time to relax. Leave me alone. I'm telling you, we, <laughs> it's a lost art to be still and know that I am God. It really is. I mean, again, I, I hate to keep picking on it, but it's, it's, it's like a little personal idol, you know what I mean? Come on now, we got pocket size idols. Take it with you throughout the day. Check it a couple times an hour. <laughs> we wonder why we're, we're stressed and overwhelmed and, and we, 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 can't, we can't rest and be at peace. It's because every time we sit down and we do have five minutes of quiet, here out comes the phone. May God help us. What gets you excited? Got to tell you what's important to you. And what are the, a lot of the topics of your conversation center around? Again, I'm not saying if any one of these questions is not Jesus, that you're a wicked, rotten, dirty sinner. But what I am telling you is if none of the answers to these questions is Jesus, we might have a problem. May we be as David in Psalm 139. I, I love the Psalms, but he says this in verse 23, 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Realize you created an idol. Number two, refuse to make excuses. Oh, boy. Anybody who says the Bible is boring and dry just hadn't really read it in my opinion. Look at verse 21, man. This is, this is peak comedy right here, okay? 
Verse 21, Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee, that thou hast brought so great a sin among, uh, upon them? Moses here <laughs> rebukes Aaron. He, he, he pins him down and says, Hey, buddy, I left you in charge. I'm just, I mean, I've been up there <laughs> 40 days or whatever. I come down here. What is all this, Aaron? What, what have you done to these people? What did they do to you? They hold a gun to your head? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Can, can I put that in our vernacular? Moses, calm down. It's, it's not that big a deal. Uh-oh. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. Can, can I translate that for us again? It, it's just the way things are, Moses. Everybody's doing it. You, you got to have a little something-something on the side. Jesus isn't enough. And then look at this one, verse 23. For they said unto me, Make us gods, and which will go before us. As for this Moses, the man which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not as what is become of him. Verse 24. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. Then I cast it into the fire. And Pastor, I know you're not supposed to add to the word of God, but can, can, just for dramatic effect, can I, can I real quick? I cast it into the fire, and poof, there came out this calf. It almost hit me. It came out so fast, Moses. You should have seen it. I couldn't control it. I can't help it. It just happened. If we're to conquer our idols this morning, we've got to stop making excuses. And we've got to start calling them what God calls them. Wicked. Amen. Sinful. Refuse to make excuses. And then I'll leave you with this. <laughs> Remove them completely. Amen. Verse number 20. And he, Moses, took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire. All right. Whew. Took care of that. Oh, oh, wait, we're not done. And ground it to powder. All right, it's not going anywhere now, Moses. No, we ain't done. And strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Uh, Aaron, it may have poofed out of, the, out of the furnace, but it's not poofing anywhere else by the time I'm done with it. We're going to talk about it a little bit tonight, Lord willing. We're going to talk about storms this evening. I encourage you to be back tonight for, for the Word of God. Talk about storms. <laughs> but old Peter, when he walked on the water, you know what he had to do before he did that? He had to let go of the boat. He had to let go of his plan B. He had to say, all right, all right, Jesus, we're doing this, and here I come. And maybe it's about time that we get, can I, can I put it this way, radical about our idols. Start doing some things that people look at you and say, what? Got rid of your TV? What? Can I tell you that there's about zero good godliness on there anyway? Yeah, <laughs> you could try to tell me, oh, my brother Drew, there's some good God-honoring stuff on Netflix, but I, pff, you'd be hard-pressed to convince me of that. You know, I'm, not just, I'm, I'm just not picking on one, one particular thing. Idols take a lot of forms. Sometimes they're not all bad. Sometimes there's just something we get out of kilter. Get out of, get, get out of, we start worshiping our relationship with somebody over worshiping our God and trying to please them over pleasing God Almighty. That's not right. Sometimes it's a job. Uh-oh, I'm going to get to meddling again. <laughs> Sometimes we're spending so many hours working, and listen, I'm all for working. In, in a day and age where people just want to sit at home and collect a check, I'm all for working with your hands. The Bible says he that doesn't work shouldn't eat. But we, get it, we can get it out of kilter and get it so that we're worshiping that job and we're living for that job. And that job is where we find our identity. And that job is where we find our security. And that job is where we, we, we find our purpose. And that's not right. Amen. Mom, Dad, your kid would rather have time with you than have the newest whatever. That's free. And may God help us. 
Help us to get to a place where we say, you know what, maybe I, I gotta make some, I gotta make some radical changes here. And again, I don't know exactly what that looks like for you. <laughs> I had a, I preached this uh, this message and had a pastor come up with to me and he said, Brother Drew, I, I started asking some of those questions and the first thing I do in the morning is talk to my wife. I, I go to her when I'm stressed and <laughs> he started going through all the questions. <laughs> Do I need to remove her completely? I'm like, no, brother. Okay, that's, 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 that's not the application here. Okay? <laughs> Woo! Maybe it may be time for us to start doing some purging. Doing some radical things to get God back where he belongs Amen. as first place in our lives. Now, I, I, I close with this illustration. I I have allergies. When I was a kid, they were real bad, real bad. I had the, the, went in for the little stick test to see what you're allergic to, and I was allergic to like uh, it was like 43 of the 47 things they tested me for. You know, my arm was just 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 blew up. Dust mites, dogs, cats, pollen, trees, grass. It's all trying to kill me. It's a lot better now. I had shots and all this stuff, and it's a lot better now. But I, I, I still, you know, get in a real dusty situation. Ooh. Get in an area with a lot of animals and a lot of dander. It's, it's, it gets real bad. But I praise the Lord for it because I do not have any food allergies. And I'd rather be able to eat than breathe. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. But how silly would it be for me to... Go to the, the pound. I, I don't know where you get dogs at, but you go, go to where you get a dog, right? And I pick out the biggest, fluffiest dog, and I take it home, and it lives in my trailer. And every day I'm coming out for service, <sighs> eyes are watering, nose, oh, it's just terrible. Hard to listen to. Blowing my nose every five minutes while I'm trying to preach. I said, Brother Drew, that's, that's silly. Why would you bring something into your trailer that's going to make you miserable? Why would you <laughs> go get something, bring it into your life that's, 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 that's killing you, it's strangling you, it's, it's, it's making you miserable? Why would you do that? And I ask you, church, when we've tasted the bread of life and drunk from the living water, why would we go and allow some idol to come in and make us miserable? Because, yeah, there's fun and sin for a season, but it just brings misery and pain. And why wouldn't we today come to this altar and say, God, no, no longer, no more. This thing has been running me for too long, and I want you back where you belong. God, there was a time where, where I cared about souls. God, there was a time where your word was alive and fresh. God, there was a time that, that, that the church was, oh, I just couldn't wait to get there, but, but now I've grown, I've grown cold, and, and it's because there's an idol in my life that's draining me and sucking all the spiritual life right out of me. And today, God, I cast it before you. I grind it to powder, and I straw it on the waters. Lord, help me. Help me remove it completely. And can I tell you, there's no substitute for the blessing of God in your life. Amen. There's no substitute for that peace. You can try to fake it and manufacture it for a while, but let's get the real deal <laughs> and remove our idols and put Jesus back where he belongs. Lord, we love you this morning. I thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, so appropriate, so applicable, so helpful to us today. Dear God, would you help us? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love, the songwriter said. Oh, God, would you help us today if an idol has crept in that we would confess it and forsake it today. In Jesus' name, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask.